Welcome back to the Ask Dr. Be Good Show, where we work every week to bring you positive things that are going on in public education today. We have a special guest today to uh, come talk to us about something that uh, some of you may have already um, been hearing about on the news, and rightly so. We've asked Professor Freedom, Clarence Glover, to come and help frame further the 400th anniversary of the observance of the enslaved Africans that came to America in Jamestown in 1619. So welcome, Professor Freedom. Glad to be with you, Dr. Good. And so you brought some things with you today, along with a lot of, of just very historical um, information that you were part of. So quickly start taking us through that journey because we're going to run out of time before you, <laughs> you run out of talk, I'm sure. Well, thank you so much. Well, yes, this is the uh, observance of the 400th year um, when 1619 Africans were brought to America by European Americans in Jamestown, which is really what I like to consider the beginning of the multicultural experience in this nation. Uh, we were not a nation then, but we were on our way to becoming a nation, and slavery had not actually started, indentured servitude, and then eventually slavery uh, evolved uh, because of the ownership of African people and the perception of ownership of African people. and so. So what makes you say that it was uh, the first multicultural um, happening in, 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 in the world? Because you had, uh, in many parts of the world, you still had people living in what I call cultural pockets. You had Europeans living in Europe. You had Asians living in Asia. You had Native Americans living in, in this country. Uh, but this was a time when, uh, of course, Europeans came here, the Native Americans were here, and then the Europeans went and brought Africans here. And so we began to see these cultural pockets come together here on this land, which eventually became America. And so uh, you, I like to suggest it was the beginning of, a, of an experiment, a multicultural experiment as a people, as people, and then as a nation, particularly as America. And so now we've been trying to work through this experience, experiment for the last 400 years. Okay, so talk a little bit about what you've brought to show us so that we can further understand how we can get better at this experiment? Well, certainly as an African-American, I try to say as a multicultural American because my life experiences reflect that of many African-Americans and even European-Americans because we are really um, uh, connected by kin, if you will, blood. Mm -hmm. Because in my own uh, uh, maternal family, my, on my mother's side, I have my great-grandfather here who raised me as a child who I grew up under, and his wife, my great-grandmother. So I knew them, and they shared many stories with me. As you can see, my great-grandfather, many times when I show this picture, said, he's a white man. <laughs> well, yes, his mother here, whose father was European-American, white, as you can see. And then I have my great-grandmother's mother, both of whom were enslaved, came out of slavery, were born into slavery, but they were able to come out of as a result of the Emancipation Proclamation. And so then I brought some of the artifacts of slavery here, of course, which is an actual set of shackles, which uh, these particular shackles would have been used on the neck of uh, a person uh, as they were brought out uh, onto a ship, uh, brought out to sell, you know, and then other chains would be placed through here to keep them connected to others. And I always like to say that slavery was a dual system because whoever put the per whoever was in the shackle was enslaved, and whoever had the keys to the shackles, they were enslaved, if you will. So you had the enslaver who was enslaved psychologically, and you had the person, the physical person. So slavery has always been a dual system, and one in which we uh, we work. And so we just have the picture, lest we forget, is a book about slavery, and then uh, uh, cotton, of course, which is the key product that. Uh, made slavery uh, so successful, being meaningful, I say, f 
for purposeful for those who had plantations, et cetera. And we're sitting now in areas of Dallas that were once cotton fields in North Dallas, the Cotton Belt Line and things like that. And below this is a documentary that I did on Dr. King with Mrs. King in 1986 in Remembrance of Martin, which, uh, which Dr. King alluded to in the 1960s. He says, and in Washington, D.C., as a matter of fact, 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. So he was alluding to that period that in spite of the fact that they were in the 60s, he was suggesting that we were still not free, that we were still suffering from the vestiges of slavery. Now you have done a lot of your philosophy, your demonstration around cotton and yes. picking cotton. Can you talk a little bit about that and about the, the analogy that, you're, that you have come up with to help other African Americans understand the the approach that you have towards cotton. Well, as I say, as I have a cotton sack here, and this is an authentic cotton sack that we have right here. And, and so often, many of my friends who look at these objects are very uh, upset. And I certainly understand about the shackles. I am upset about the shackles, yes. But I am not upset about the cotton because the cotton was not the problem. It was slavery or the condition that was the problem. So I, I like to compare that to uh, my work in South Africa in terms of on the South African apartheid movement here in Dallas in the, in the 80s. And, and now I've come with this analogy that what do you think would happen with uh, the African, South African men, particularly in the diamond mines after apartheid? Do you think that after apartheid they say, well, we don't want these old dirty diamonds. You know, you can take them, you know. <laughs> and if they will, we'll, I don't think so. I think they'll say, no, give me the diamonds. <laughs> we'll keep our diamonds. We'll keep working we'll the keep diamonds. We'll keep working yes. the diamonds, yes. We'll, I'll go dig more diamonds. That's right. But let me get benefits from these diamonds. This is white gold. King cotton. So it was not the cotton. Cotton is the, is, is the goal, if you will, of, of our nation. And so uh, therein, uh, I, I'm a cotton picker. And so I have a, a video, a brief video there of, of, of me picking cotton that talks about the work ethic and that we can share. Okay. Hello, this is Professor Freedom. How are you doing? I'm down in Central Texas here in the cotton field, and I'm in the midst of picking cotton. This is real cotton, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. And Professor Freedom is out here, just like our ancestors used to do. And I'm just excited about doing this. And here I am, I put it in my sack. There we go. We just pick this cotton you see here. You got to pick it between these bowls right here. And that's what you have to do. And just pull it out. So we want to uh, let you see us do it down here in Central Texas cotton. But this is how our ancestors did it back during slavery and during Jim Crow era. But there's nothing wrong with the cotton. There was something wrong with not getting paid for picking the cotton. So we need to understand the difference between working hard and not getting paid for working hard, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm glad you joined me for a few seconds today. This is Professor Freedom wishing you a cotton picking day. Have All right. Uh, so I'm hoping that this helps further your um, people's understanding around your working, your continual work around bringing cotton to our students, mm -hmm. because I know that there have been some people who, again, it's, you know, they're challenging. Yes, driven. and so that's a good analogy that you have. Let's go back a little bit. You were very active in the 70s and 80s. Talk a little bit about that time period in your life. Well, um, coming out of the, the com com community and the plantation community and farms that I grew up in, again, the uh, cotton was not the problem, but as my theme says, I, I say, uh, I want to take the chains off your brain so your minds can work. And so that started a long time ago, back uh, during the 70s when I was in high school and uh, was among some of the, f one of the first African Americans, for an example, to go to Washington, D.C. And, and be a part of the National 4-H Congress where I worked on civil rights issues. And, and there, that's a part of taking the change because it was not only taking the change of my body and the mind, but also of those who I was working with, many of my European American colleagues, friends, and so forth, trying to them understand that, again, that this is a dual movement, that the civil rights movement is a dual movement. Dr. King said uh, the civil rights movement was designed to save the black man's body and the white man's soul. So he always saw it as a dual movement mm. together. And, and so from there, it just led on to many other things in terms of uh, working with the Let's talk about that. You spent some time at SMU. Sure, yes. So talk about that time period. Well, I came there to work on my master's in theology. And uh, coming out of Louisiana, where I was pastoring, I uh, was pastoring 
uh, the CME congregation at the time, and I came to Perkins and started my master's in theological studies. And eventually I got involved in student synod and eventually became involved in the student affairs and eventually became a full-time staff person. Well, at that time at SMU, it, it had the second largest KA flag on top of the house, and I was engaged in, you know, trying to remove those things from the campus. It's the 80s? It, yes, the 80s, 1980, as a matter of fact, so that we had these tensions, these very deep racial tensions at the time. We had the old South at the time at SMU, and, and so we had to help staff, students understand that if we're going to be a multicultural campus, that we must understand the sensitivities of others and the concerns of others, and be it African Americans, Asians, you, uh, the Jewish community. And so then I became advisor to African American students and eventually director of multicultural uh, of student affairs and an adjunct professor of African American studies. So within all of that, we were able to work with students and program council, Greek councils, and so forth. And the whole intent was not to have a minority program, but to have a multicultural program where not only students of color, uh, Hispanic, African, Asian, but also European American students and staff were working together again to try to make this experiment that we started back in 1619 mm -hmm. <laughs> to become a reality because we were still suffering from some of the vestiges of all of that. So how did you help SMU change some of its policies and, and, and develop its cultural philosophy? And the reason I'm digging is because I'm going to transition over the course of the next few minutes and how you did that with us. So how did you do it in a big place like SMU? Well, of course, SMU, and it's interesting because we had incidents then, as we're having incidents now. And we had incidents at that time. Uh, but also, I worked with Mrs. King and Mrs. Parks uh, and Dr. Bernard Lafayette. I was working at the King Center in Atlanta, uh, helping to train students in nonviolent strategies towards social change. So I was going back and forth to Atlanta at the time, during the 80s and 90s, to the King Center. Uh, the King Center for Nonviolent Social Change. So when incidents arose on our campus at SMU, I was able to apply some of these principles, and we were able to uh, develop legislation because Dr. King told us that we needed legislation in place. We needed laws, we needed things in place. So some things that happened on campus, uh, and we put together diversity harassment policy, one of the first, if not the first, in the country at a major university. And that policy then, the Judicial Council and uh, so forth, was able to use that when things happen. And so that policy is on still to this day, and many other campuses later on fashion their policies. And then we have training, the intergroup living seminar we developed, uh, our multicultural awareness programs. We developed the Blue and Red Day, which was the largest simulated, simulated segregation day in the nation, uh, patterned after early, I mean, uh, uh, Jane Elliott's blue eye, brown eyes experiment mm -hmm. after Dr. King's assassination, but we divide the whole campus. So at SMU, we were able to do a number of things, and while there, I also found Dr. King's speech that he gave there in March of 1966. Uh, many people didn't know that, but he, he did speak at SMU, and you can go online now and, and, and see this, hear the speech and see the articles that I found and framed uh, his speech here in Dallas, which was on integration. And, and t again, here we are in 2019, still working to make this dream a reality. I'm just curious, how'd you find it? That Dr. Willis Tate told me about it. And, uh, because that, that wasn't online in those days. No, so it was it not. Was hidden it, was, it, was some hid little it was hidden in the DeGoya Library. And Dr. Willis Tate, uh, during his life, he and I would talk, and he mentioned to me, because so many people said Dr. King didn't come to Dallas and do anything, so he didn't have a movement, but he said that he spoke. And so I began to look around, dig into the archives, and I, into uh, the school, and then I found the tape, then I found the articles that you can see now online, and I had them framed, and they're in the student center, and now you can go online and hear his speech uh, that he gave it to me, which I think is so instructive today uh, and historical, and for us to hear, and schools should be using it here in Dallas. We should be using that speech. It's transcribed now. Uh, there's a transcribed uh, portion, mm -hmm. and there's an oracle. And we in Dallas should be using it because for Dr. King to speak at a major university was not a common occurrence during that time. So we're very fortunate. So we'll, we'll put a link in the pot in the yes. post to that, so yes. that people can access it more easily. Matter of fact, um, we will put a a link to most of the things that we're referring to today, just so that people can access it easily. Yes. Um, this um, this information is so important that we don't want to make it any harder for them to get to it. Correct. Um, so after SMU, that you transitioned to one of the largest ISDs in the country. 
Well, yes, uh, here, here again, the issue of race and racism uh, pulled me uh, from SMU to the Dallas Independent School District, where at that time, uh, during the early 90s, there was some very intense racial issues going on in the district, DISD district. I had worked with the district while at SMU, particularly to change the name from black to African American, because I will, I'm an advocate that there is no black geographical context in terms of there's no black place called black continent, there's an African continent. So being an African American is what I have referenced in my research that uh, we, we have pushed that further before I got to the addiction when I was on a, a committee in DISD to change the name from black students to African American students. So help me understand the context. Was that something that was coming from another part of the country or is that developed here? What? Well, no, it was, uh, I was on a committee, that was a committee at DISD. And it was just my personal. Uh, but I mean, but that's a nationwide term that's been in use for now decades. Yeah, so right, right. That started in yes, Dallas it, uh, ISD. Yes, Dallas. It was really? before because wow. black. We was all black primarily across the country, mm -hmm. and it's just like the textbook adoption process. Dallas DISD is a very important district. Uh, when I got to the district, uh, we also we, we we put together the diversity harassment policy for DISD. Uh, and the training m program around that. Uh, we brought that reaching to teach in a multicultural world. But also we, 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 we they had the multicultural education program with Dr. Do Yvonne Ewell and others have put in place, but they did not have a textbook uh, component to be com complement to that. So while at the district, I put together the textbook adoption process, multicultural textbook adoption process, and that then complemented the multicultural education plan, and as a result of DISD having the, mul the multicultural textbook adoption process, it affected the entire nation, because all of the major textbook companies, you know, uh, followed suit. Funds, yes, exactly. And, and then we had an impact. A few years later, you may have heard where they, the state board debated it, and they began to r undo some of that, you know, and so, but that was done here and that. So DISD has been a leading player because we had a program called Educating One Race, Many Cultures, which was a major district-wide program that came out of my office. Well, talk a little bit about that philosophy that you have, that we actually aren't made up of a bunch of different races. No, we're it's not. just one. So talk we about that. We were just that. one race. Uh, uh, Ashley Montague spoke about in his book, Man's Most Dangerous Myth, Race. Race is a fallacy. It is not a fact. Is that we're not different races. It was uh, uh, the, bot uh, the uh, Swedish botanist Linnaeus, who in identifying species of animals, and as Europe began to move out and see people of color, they placed people of color into what is considered an animal species identification. So rather than being human, people of color were species, identified as species, so that we use, they use the word ethnic, for an example. When you hear the word, oh, that's very ethnic, that's ethnic food, that's an ethnic dress, it meant something that was non-European, you see. And so you saw that distinction. Well, now the research shows us, uh, particularly uh, Richard Leakey, uh, uh, Alice, Louis Leakey and Alice Leakey there in Kenya, uh, and their son came to SMU, Richard Leakey, and I have an article, I was at him, I, uh, his lecture, and I have an article that he did, and he, he challenged SMU then that all of us are descendants of, the, of Africa and that we come from a common DNA f uh, source, uh, mitochondria Eve, and he, th he knew it upset some people. But now uh, you can go to Spencer Wells' work in terms of journey of man, it's called, a journey of humans, I like to say. But there is a uh, link you can go to now and pull up the journey and, and see how Africa, the DNA comes out and goes to a Europe and Asia, etc., which connects all of us back. And it suggested that we're actually 50th cousins and that we are all connected in that biological and just the melanin uh, uh, levels in our bodies, uh, our hair and our skins are only very minute differences. So we're all human beings. Is what we're all human beings. <laughs> that's that's and, the and, race, and right? We're all human beings, but we have our culture traits, meaning that music may be different, well, our foods may be different, and that's a part of the adaptation to our physical environment. But uh, we are all basically human beings, uh, but it's the cultural differences that we have not come to accept. Uh, and respect, uh, but if we affirm the fact that we all one common human family, and that's why we say one race, many cultures. So, uh, when you left mm. Dallas ISD, you opened up your own uh, Sankova. 
yes, yes. business. Sen- you want to talk a little bit Sen- about Sankofa that? Education Services, yes. And that was a result of my own journey going back to Africa and um, on my uh, father's side. This is my mother's side, but on my father's side is uh, Glover. I, uh, there were many Africans after being brought here to America after the emancipation. They uh, went back to Africa through mm-hmm. Liberia particularly, and uh, Talbots, Thomas, jo- Tal- Johnsons, Taylors, etc. cetera. Uh, Glovers were among uh, mm-hmm. that group of family who went back, and I had worked with the Ghanaian community here many, many years, and I knew of the story, this line, and so in 2004, I actually went to Africa, and through a very unique uh, meeting, I met uh, the Glover family in Accra, mm-hmm. Ghana, and it was such a moving moment and sure. because of the stories that I knew and they knew how to connect it. And so we have been able to connect and uh, uh, through other, do other things. But that lets us know that there is a international connection here, just as Europeans go back to Ireland, France, Spain, Mexico, et cetera. I did that this summer. Exactly. You know, my, my, <laughs> uh, on my mother's side, both my great-grandmothers were Irish, Ryan, and Reed. That's right. Of course, I can't do much with that because that's like Smith and Jones. But and, and then what happens? Many African Americans get stumped and they say, "Well, I can't do that." I say, "But at least you can go back to West Africa, because uh, even with 1619, we're looking at the Africans who were brought from Angola, the 20, uh, uh, who were brought from Angola. So we were not brought from East Africa, uh, c- uh, Central Africa, or South Africa. We were fundamentally yes. brought from West Africa, and we see the traditions that are very common and connected. Right. Um, so. You have been with Legacy now for six years, and what have you tried to do for us? Well, because you and I, we, we, we come from a similar background in DISD, and we value some of those same things, we saw things happening. Uh, I, I saw the, a great opportunity to really build what I call multicultural capacity. Institutionalized. Institutionalized, that's right. right. Mm-hmm. Institutionalizing multicultural capacity from the superintendent boards all the way down. And that was a great, great opportunity to to do that. And you've allowed me to do that by writing policies and have, you know to submit to you to the board uh, philosophies, policies, and then practices that we ex- that that are, that are expected. Because once they're institutionalized, now there are expectations mm-hmm. that that right. people should follow. And 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 you when you do that, um, you create expectations of cultural respect, cultural awareness, cult self esteem, you know, knowing one's own culture and respecting others. And and that has translated into having a majority minority staff, yes. which is very rare to yes. find. Exactly, exactly. So we are majority minority. Let me go ahead, since I have it up, um, yes. and read the philosophy of legacy, the cultural philosophy of Legacy Wonderful. Preparatory Charter Academy. It is that every educator and scholar's culture, i.e. history, language, dialect, family values, music, food, customs, is important to achieving academic success. Mm -hmm. Scholar self-image, motivation, and academic achievement are all affected to the extent that legacy works to include scholars' cultures in their education. Educators are expected to be committed to multicultural pedagogy and perspectives that will be practiced in lessons, activities, and projects. Multicultural pedagogy and perspectives will have an important emphasis in all subjects at all grade levels and in the entire district, school, and community environments. Exactly. And we, so we, we've had that since our second year, I so think. Yes, second We're year. We're starting our eighth year. And um, that has, your role has, 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 I don't want. I don't know if I should use the word transition, but we started you doing some very traditional things. You met with teachers. Sure. Um, you we had you in front of kids, but now you've been with us long enough to where you are impacting kids over time. You have a mentoring program. You have a gentleman's group. Talk right. a little bit about that. Well, as you just said, we we uh, our basic foundation was in our uh, mentoring program, of course and then uh, PTOs and work with parents, and then teacher training, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, work with educators. And by doing that, we were able to establish, particularly for veteran teachers, who are some of veteran teachers. Now, because I've noticed uh, in the district, you have teachers who come on board, then you have some who've been here, but they they sort of share that cultural uh, pedagogy and information and and their planning process, Mm -hmm. and, and it's infused. So you have leaders who are now understanding that this is who we are. And this is what we do. So that when we are teaching uh, multicultural, when you're doing curriculum, uh, 
in this diverse population, you have students who are particularly predominantly uh, students of color, mm -hmm. and they know that they're being affirmed, their styles of learning are being affirmed, mm -hmm. uh, while at the same time they're learning about each other. Uh, and, yeah, and we're and starting, mm -hmm. matter of fact, we're starting our fourth year of restorative practice, which is exactly. a social justice uh, discipline management technique. I hate mm -hmm. to use the word technique because it sounds so clinical, but uh, it's about understanding that we have to reach our kids Correct. and they have to be respected and they have to feel that respect. Right. You can't punish the trauma out mm -hmm. of a kid. Well, that goes along with what I, what I uh, SMU, I studied under Dr. Lawrence Kohlberg at Harvard in the area of moral education and human development. And he, uh, expe he ex uh, put forth what we call just school theory. And in a just school community, you, you have the stages of moral decision making, where students are part of that, mm -hmm. where they're part of creating. That's why in our, my, in my program I have four C's, I call them the four C's. That's co uh, cognition, culture, character, and citizenship. And, and particularly in the citizenship, that, that we, the stu that, that they are part of the community. They are part of the, the body. And so we try to let them know they have to make governing decisions. And, and, and as you're saying, restorative justice, when something is wrong, how do we work through this and find out what went wrong and how do we restore a, a community back to, um, to, just, to a just environment? Instead of punishing. We're learning it, yes. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. such a, a – it's – it's been amazing how hard it is to get our adults to embrace the thought of not punishing kids for behavior, but to try to understand what's causing, what, what is the root cause mm -hmm. of that behavior and the way it's playing out. Mm -hmm. So, but what, we're what, working hard at it. What I think what happens is that uh, the understanding of, uh, of actions and consequences and the word punishment, I think, may not be an appropriate word, but when, when students, because students and human beings will act out and do things, I think we're talking about the 1619 to 2019, mm -hmm. and we're still seeing issues of injustice, and we're, we're still seeing some negative things in our society. So how do we help people to hold, be held accountable for their actions, that what are the negative actions that in a society, in a community, serve to disrupt the harmony and the order of that community. And if I am doing something to disrupt that harmony in that community, I have to take responsibility for that, mm -hmm. and be it called punishment or whatever, but, but somehow understand that all of these things are, uh, uh, if you are a type of cyclical process, mm -hmm. that if, if, if we don't uh, pull one of them out in, in the cycle, then it continues. That's right. Yeah, we, we really uh, have really committed our district to getting better at restorative practice because it's just the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. We're almost out of time, so would you talk a little bit about the, what you have for us this year and your programs, and then we'll talk about summer if we have time. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll have to have you back. <laughs> well, we're just coming out of summer. How about that? We're coming out of summer into the fall. Uh, where we've had some great summer enrichment programs and with DART and SMU and uh, North Park and uh, Mercedes, and we just want other want parents to be involved this year. This year we're going to put a particular emphasis on parents, strong emphasis on parents because we need them. And so we start our mentoring programs uh, where I go to uh, Plano and uh, as well as Mesquite after school programs, and young men and women have grown up in this program. Uh, some of them have been since kindergarten, some of them are graduating mm -hmm. and getting to be seniors, and so we're seeing this developmental process. And I'd like to begin to follow them, see how they're doing, and want to also work with the uh, teachers more this year to see how what we're doing and what is happening in the classroom uh, is connecting with the parents, uh, with the teachers, excuse me. And then also with our parents, uh, Planned. I've talked with um, the campus directors about having more activities with Professor Freedom and the parents so that they would come out uh, uh, pizza with Professor Freedom <laughs> and activities so they can really do things at home to have complement the things that we do both in our after school programs and in the classroom. And then with our gentlemen's class, which is just uh, young men who uh, you uh, took uh, them to the Cadillac place this <laughs> they, summer no to the Mercedes Mercedes oh yeah oh, some Mercedes, oh, Mercedes yeah. place once a gentleman always a gentleman you know <laughs> and you and brought ties to our seniors they, at yes, graduation at graduation the Mercedes yes Mercedes our, uh, and Ford uh, to our partners and we are 
b- growing our business partners mm-hmm. to be with us. And uh, once a gentleman, always a gentleman, um, and helping them to understand that transition to manhood and that l- legacy in Plano. We're working with the uh, fashion show there, the ladies program. Yes. That they, and so uh, w- slowly it's beginning to evolve, and parents are talking about how and that has been they're calling us saying they want their children to their sons to participate and we're going to be doing more mesquite because we have a strong one over at uh, legacy plano uh, so we're really excited about this year and uh, what's going to happen well we certainly thank you for coming and helping us further our understanding of of, of cultural philosophy what it is what how we need to get better at it and what a big part you've played in the in Dallas and then some of the things that happened in Dallas that have worked nationwide. So we certainly thank you for your civil rights uh, contributions. Talk, you forgot to mention you received, you, you were inducted to the African American oh, Hall of Fame? Yes, just recently uh, the, um, I was inducted to the uh, Dallas County African American Heritage Hall of Fame. And um, we had our induction ceremony, so I was very, very proud and very humble to have received that. Yeah. Well, you're finally getting some recognition for that hard 40, 50 year work that you've been doing, right? <laughs> thank you. Thank so, you. anyway, I that we're, we're out of time, but um, we'll have to have you back. There's things that will be going on, especially your summer work. We don't ever get enough kids for your summer work, so That's we're correct. really going to try to get, get, get some parents, more marketing out. Get yeah. the parents involved and uh, so they can make that commitment early. Yes. And uh, because the programs of quality, everything from the Bush uh, Museum. Oh, I mean, yes. I'm just. Yeah, the, they, the, they, it, they, it just pains <laughs> me to th- when I don't see you have higher numbers. Yes. Because, you, because of not only where they go, but what you have the kids do. Yes. So, uh, having said that, thank you again for thank coming. Thank you so much. Thank you That's for bringing your that. artifacts and uh, for making uh, another quality show for us. Thank you so kindly. Thank you for tuning in to the Ask Dr. Be Good show. For more information on Legacy Preparatory Charter Schools, visit our website, LegacyPCA.com, or call 469-249-1099. And remember to like us on Facebook, where we stream live weekly Tuesdays at 3 p.m.